All right, in this video, we're going to take a look at the save prompt screen. Up to now, we have our free play mode working very nicely. All of our notes are working correctly. But we now need to be able to save out our songs. Sure, right now, free play technically doesn't do anything. Exactly. I mean, we can listen to the notes we're creating. We see the notes get created. But as soon as we exit the mode, all of those notes go away. So what we're going to do in this video is we'll make a screen that will be shown at the end of a free play session. When we're done dropping notes onto the timeline, we'll be presented with a screen that will ask us if we would like to save our song to an actual song file. Now, in order to accomplish this, we'll need to add a little bit of state information to global state because inside of our free play screen, we have our song instance that is having the notes added to it but we'll need to move to another screen in order to ask the player whether or not they want to save. Mm -hmm. That means that that song instance is going to need to be accessible both by the free play screen and by this new prompt screen that we're going to create. So we will be adding some additional global information. From there on out, we'll have the fairly standard procedure of creating a new menu screen and setting it up to handle the saving operation. So let's jump in and get started. First, we'll move down to Global State. So over here in our Solution Explorer, we'll jump down to Game, where we can load up our Global State class. Inside of Global State, we'll jump in at the very end of our fields, right after Scores, and we are going to add two new fields. First, we're going to add a field that will hold a song instance, and we'll also add a field that will hold the name, the actual file name, that this song should use when being saved. So we'll begin with our first field as a public static song field. And we can call this field hold song. And the reason for this name is just a relatively general name saying that we wish to hold on to a song between two different screens. Okay. Alright, for the second field, we'll need our file name, so we'll make a public static string field which we will call hold song file name because of course the song itself doesn't actually have any text name associated with it mm -hmm. so we'll need to hold that in between the two the, the reason we're actually holding a file name is it's going to be the free play screen which is going to decide on the actual file name so both of those things will need to get handed over to the save screen all right, before we jump into the save screen, let's set up one of the configuration parameters for it. We need to specify the location that our save menu will appear. So to do that, we'll jump up to our content folder, jump into style, and then load up our style.xml configuration file. Here at the bottom, we have the setting for save prompt. So we'll change this to a value of 360 in X and 377 in Y. All right, now with this preliminary information in place, we are now ready to jump into the save screen itself. So what we'll do is over here in the Solution Explorer, we'll move down to our Menus folder, and we'll add a new class. We'll call this class Screen Save Prompt. And once our new class file loads up, we'll clean up the sub namespace, leaving it at Drum Game and we will add in some using statements. We'll begin with the standard for Microsoft.xna.framework and also framework.graphics and we are going to add an additional using statement to gain access to system.io so we'll add in using System.io. That makes sense because we need that in order to create our own files. So with our using statements in place, let's jump down to the save uh, screen save prompt class and make sure that it extends screen menu so that we gain access to all of the menu functionality. All right, here inside of our screen save prompt, we'll begin by setting up the selectable items, and we'll do that inside of a public constructor. So I'll have public screen save prompt, and inside of this public constructor, we'll set up our item names. We'll look into this dot item names, and we will add 
the value yes and we'll add a second one for the value of no. So when it asks if you want to save, they'll be able to see yes or no? Exactly. We'll yes. just keep it very simple. All right, moving on from here, let's put together two different uh, sections of drawing code. We'll make an override to the draw method itself, and that will allow us to draw the name of the specific file, basically the prompt itself. We will, we will ask the user if they want to save to a specific file. And we'll also add an override to draw menu item, and that'll take care of getting the yes and no options drawn. So let's begin with the draw method. We'll drop in an override to draw, and we will, of course, leave our call to base.draw so that we retain our background drawing. Now we need to put together some text to draw. And this text is going to be the actual question saying if we want to save a specific file name. So we'll make a string variable to hold this value. We'll call it save text. And this variable will be set to a formatted string. We're going to use uh, string formatting to drop the hold song file name into our prompt. So this will be done using string dot format and then we'll put together the prompt as save to argument zero drop in a question mark and then we'll pass on the actual string that we want to have dropped in place. That's of course going to be stored in global state if we look into the hold song file name field. <coughs> Excuse me. Now hold song file name is going to be set up as an absolute path with full path information. And on the save prompt screen, the user is not going to be concerned about where the game exists. They're just looking at this name. Mm -hmm. So before we display it, we're first going to run it through path dot get file name, and that way we'll show just the file name itself. So we can close off the parenthesis for get file name. One additional parenthesis to close off our string formatting, and that should take care of our save text. Now we are ready to turn around and draw this text. So we'll use our sprite batch and we will call draw string. Into draw string we will feel, feed our large font. So style dot font large. We need to drop in the text so this will be save text. For a position we'll simply drop in the root position of our save prompt. So looking into style positions here we have save prompt, and we'll use that value directly. And for the color, we'll just draw using the normal text color. So we'll look into colors dot text normal. All right, that should take care of our draw method. Again, draw is simply giving us the ability to send out this prompt in addition to the menu items that the menu is going to consist of. Now we do, of course, need to draw those menu items. So we're going to drop in an override to draw menu item. Here we do not need the call to base dot draw menu item. And now we're going to have the relatively standard fare of grabbing the specific text for the item in question, measuring that text, positioning the text, and finally drawing the text. Mm -hmm. So we'll begin with a string variable and we'll drop we'll write this down as text. And we'll use this to grab the current item. This dot item names sub item index. Now moving from here, we need to turn around and measure this text. So we'll make a vector two called text dimensions or text dims, and that will be equal to style uh, style dot font large dot measure string, and we will feed in our text variable. We also need our position, so we'll copy the save prompt position into a variable so that we can offset it as necessary for our various items. So we'll make a vector2 called position, and that will be equal to style positions dot save prompt. All right, now that we've got this root position set up, we do need to apply some offsets. Of course, we're going to need to move down the screen item by item. We're also going to indent a little bit from our original prompt. If you remember, here inside of draw, we have our save prompt being drawn directly at the save prompt position. So we'd like to indent a little bit in X. In order to accomplish that, we'll simply take our position var uh, yes, variable mm -hmm. and take its X component 
and we will increment that by 40. So we'll move to the right 40 pixels. Alright, now we need to set up our Y position. So we'll take position.y, and as we're going item by item, we will increment this by the current item as an offset. So, of course, that's item index. Now, normally this would be item index times text dimensions dot y. Now, in this case, we already have some text existing at this location, assuming that we're looking at item 0. If we're mm -hmm. looking at yes. So, 0, and then we'll draw directly at the prop. So, we'll take position exactly. The problem is, this save text is already going to be drawn at that uh, position. Right. So we need to advance an additional line before we begin drawing these menu items. So to do that, we'll simply offset our item index by 1. We'll make sure that we drop this part of the operation into parentheses to give it precedence, so that way we move an additional item before we begin calculating our location. Gotcha. Now we do want to add a little bit of extra spacing in between the items, so we'll take this result and multiply it by 1.1f. So we give ourselves just a little bit more room between the items. Mm -hmm. Alright, with all of this information assembled, we're ready to begin drawing. So we'll call upon spritebatch.drawString. We'll drop in our font large from style.fontlarge. Our text is held in the text variable our position in the position variable, and color is passed in via the color parameter to draw a menu item. All right, with this in place now, we have the basis for our items and for our drawing code. Now we need to add the necessary input handling to this save screen. So we'll jump up right before the draw method, and we will override our input pressed method. So here we have override input pressed and we will of course leave our call to base.input pressed to get menu navigation up and down handled now what we're interested in is what happens when the user hits the select button so we'll say that if input data dot named input is equal to named inputs dot select now if the user has hit the select button we're going to look and see whether or not the yes input was pressed because in both cases as soon as the uh, select button is pressed we're going to pop the uh, save screen out of the way. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact we can drop that in first so you no, know, regardless of what item is selected we're going to issue a call to screen dot pop rather pop screen so no matter what input is pressed the save prompt screen will end up going away, and yeah. then whatever screen was left will If they say, show. yes, I want to save, it's got to go away. If they say, no, I don't want to save, it still has to go away. So in either case, we'll have screen off screen. Now, we will do an additional check to see if yes had been hit. And if so, then we'll do the necessary saving operation. So we'll do a check and say, if this dot selection index is equal to zero, that would, of course, then be looking at item zero or yes, then we need to save out the current song. Now in order to save the song itself, we need access to the actual song instance. So that's held in global state dot hold song. So the song instance, of course, is going to have a method called save song file. Save song file is going to need a file name. Now that is also held in global state. Global state dot hold song file name will be the name of our song, so we can pass that name into save song file, and that takes care of the saving operation. Very nice. Now, once this song gets saved, that's going to add to our overall song library. Mm -hmm. So we need to turn around and tell our song library to rescan all of the songs so that this newly created song gets registered into that library. So that means we'll take our song library and reissue a call to scan songs. Now for the path, we'll simply pass in global state dot song path. So that way our newly created song will appear in the song list if we jump back out to the main menu and then select single or multiplayer. Nice. All right, with all of our input and drawing code in place, that will take care of the screen save prompt itself. Now we need to turn our attention to screen free play so that we can properly invoke the save prompt. So over here inside of free play, which we can bring up again from inside of game, we have our screen free play class. 
Let's go up to the very top of this class, right after process show. The way that we're going to invoke the save screen is going to be whenever we move away from free play. Mm -hmm. So we're actually going to leverage the process hide method, okay. which is going to be automatically called by the screen system the moment the free play screen is popped off of the stack. Yeah, for a second I thought you were going to do something with process show. I was about to be really impressed. I was <laughs> like, how are you going to do this? Oh, we'll save it using the future. <laughs> But no, in this case, we'll leverage process hide because that's the point at which the free play screen has gone away. So that's the point that we'll decide whether or not there are some notes. And if there's notes, then we'll ask the user if we want to save them. Gotcha. So we'll make our override here to process hide. And we don't need our call to base.processHide. And we will instead put together the necessary uh, checks. The first check we need to do here is whether or not we have any notes because we won't bother showing the save screen if the user has entered free play mode and has decided to immediately exit back out okay. without recording any notes. Yeah, because they could accidentally fill their song list with a whole bunch of empty songs. So what we'll do is a simple check. and We'll see if our current song instance here inside of the free play screen has any notes. So if song.notes.count is greater than zero, then we do have notes and we do need to continue saving. If we don't have any notes, then nothing else will happen inside a process hide, and the screen will simply disappear as it has done before. Mm -hmm. Now, if we have notes that need to be saved, the actual operation we need to do is to set up our hold song file name and hold song fields inside of global state. So, global state will have our hold song, and that's of course going to be equal to the current song instance, this dot song. So that one's easy enough. Now we also need the song file name. Now, in a very simplistic manner, we could look at this and say that all we would need to do would be to just set hold song file name to something like freeplay.song. And then that would give a file name that could be used. Of course, we need to combine this with the full path to give a, a complete path to the save system. Now, we don't want to do this directly because that would mean every time we went to save a song, we would be overwriting the same song file. Mm -hmm. So in order to avoid this, what we'll do is we'll set up a little bit of code that will look at the current name and see if that name exists on the hard drive already. If it does, then it will advance the number of the song. So instead of saying free play, we could say something like free play 001. Gotcha. Then next time we go to save, we could check and see if this name exists, and if it does, advance the number to two, and so on. So technically they could save, like, what, a thousand songs before they throw an exception of some sort? Or just before they mess up the padding, because um, yeah. it'll it'll freely go above the, the three padding if they were to save song number 1,000. Okay, gotcha. Um, but in this case, we're going to assume that most players probably aren't going to sit down and hammer out a thousand songs exactly. in short order. And they're really dedicated to this game. Man. So they'll use this as a fair balance. Now, in order to check and assemble our names, what we'll do is we'll put together a loop, and we'll set up this loop so that it will advance an internal counter and continue retrying file names until it finds an open slot or a file name that does not already exist. So to do this, we'll drop down a few variables. We'll make a string variable. We'll call this file name. We'll, we'll use this as our temp working file name. We'll keep advancing and recreating this as necessary. We'll also drop down an integer simply called number, and we'll start this off at zero. And you could read this as simply song number. We'll mm -hmm. try, we'll start this number off. When we go to assemble the name, we'll start at one, so we'll be advancing this, and then we'll continue to advance number until we reach an open slot. Now, the loop that we're going to use to create this is going to be a do while loop. And the reason we'll do this is so that we can have an iteration run before the first check because it's very possible that the first check may be open if we have not yet saved a song, and we don't want to uh, rewrite our file name assembly code more than once. Mm -hmm. So we'll drop down a do loop. So we'll say do the following while the file name does not currently exist, or while the file name does exist. There you go. So we'll say while file dot exists you also notice that file, the type that we're going to use to do our check, is not currently open. We need to open up the system.io namespace here inside of screen free, free play 
in order to gain access to some of these methods. Mm. So here in Freeplay, we'll drop into using for system.io. And let's see, system, io, that should take care of our namespace. If we drop down here, file, the type is now accessible, and we can gain access to file.exists. That way we can check and see if our current file name has been reached or not. So again, what this means here is that we will continue looping as long as our file name still exists. So if we assembled this name, for example, file name freeplay zero zero one dot song. Mm -hmm. If that existed, then we'll continue this loop and advance to two and three and so on. Gotcha. Now in order to advance our song and reassemble the name, we'll first take number here inside of our loop and we'll increment it. So every iteration of the loop we simply increment number. This is why we uh, start a number off at zero. So that way in the first iteration is where we actually set that to one. Now we can use that number to, ace, to assemble a file name. So we'll take our file name variable, and we'll set that to be equal to string.format. So we can put together our name of freeplay, and then for the numbers we'll specify argument zero dot song. And then we'll feed in the current number. Now in order to establish this style of padding where we have three digits, what we'll do is we'll take our formatting inside of argument zero, mm -hmm. we'll specify this as argument zero colon, and then specify three additional zeros in order to describe the padding that we would like used in conjunction with this parameter. Now once again, this is going to result in a file name similar to what we had dropped down as an example. We need to expand this relative name into an absolute path. And so we'll do that by combining song path with the file name that we have created so far. So we'll take file name again, and we'll set it to be equal to path.combine, where we will feed in our song path, which is found in global state. So we'll have global state dot song path, and then we'll feed in what is currently held within file name. Gotcha. So you're just a kind of attaching that original path back to the file name. Exactly. We're just expanding this out to an absolute path. So once this loop finishes running, we should have a file name which does not exist and is therefore free and open to be used by the saving code. That means here inside of hold song file name, we'll set this to be equal to file name. Now once we have our song and our file name set up and ready to go, it's now time to turn around and push the save prompt onto the stack to show it. So we'll look into screen and we'll call push screen and the screen name will be save prompt. So this takes care of screen free play. As soon as the free play screen hides it checks to see if there's any notes in the current song. If there is then it assembles a file name using a loop to make sure that we're picking a file name that doesn't already exist. Mm -hmm. Then we're passing that file name onto hold song file name and we're also saving the current song instance into hold song. Then we push save prompt onto the stack, and everything can be handled in save prompt from there on out. Now we do need to get the save prompt screen created and registered into our screen's list. So let's jump over to our game class here in game one. Then if we look under load content, here at the bottom we have our screen's section. So I'm going to take this last line we currently have in our screen's registration, which is the free play screen, copy and paste it to duplicate it, and we'll register a new screen as save prompt. We'll make sure that this screen is an instance of screen screen save prompt. Alright, with all this put together we should be ready to jump in and test. So if we build the game we see everything loads up with no errors. If we jump into free play, free play begins taking off notes now before we jump any farther, we did set the tempo lower to demonstrate mm -hmm. some things in earlier lessons. I want to go ahead and set that back to the appropriate speed. Okay. In Screen Free Play, we had set up some temporary code here inside of Reset where we had hard-coded BPM to 60. Let's remove that and let's restore our tempo being set to default recording tempo. Now if we jump into Free Play, we have the proper tempo. We can hit a few notes. And then if we try to jump away from the free play screen by hitting escape, 
We're presented with a save prompt. Nice. Currently, it's asking us if we would like to save to freeplay001.song. And you can see the little indentation and everything. So, yes, yeah, so we have our indentation for the menu items. We can use up and down to select them. And if we hit yes, then save prompt screen goes away. Mm-hmm. And once the save prompt screen is gone, you notice we jump back to the main menu, not back into free play. Right. The reason is that free play was in the process of hiding. Mm-hmm. So it was essentially on its way out. That means once we jumped away from uh, save prompt, we would jump all the way back to the main menu. Now here at the main menu, let's briefly jump into single player. And note the fact that a new song has appeared, free play 001. Nice. We can load up this new song and see that we have notes inside of it. And we could hit those notes and play it as we would any other song. So, just to test a few other things, let's jump into free play and drop down a few more notes and see that if we jump out of our free play mode now, we're now asked if we want to save free, free play to dot mm-hmm. song. So we can see that we are advancing forward in songs. So we'll hit yes to that, jump into free play one more time, and this time we won't drop down any notes at all. So we won't hit any drum notes and we'll just hit escape. And see, we can jump directly okay. away from free play. Then one final case to check is if we drop down a note, drop, we're presented with save prompt if we want to save song 3. Let's hit no to this one, so we do not wish to save free play 3.song. If we hit no and go up to single player, we see that we only have songs 1 and 2. Nice. So everything is working perfectly. So with that, we have successfully assembled a save prompt for our free play mode. And with that, that's going to wrap up this video. Excellent.